Climate justice is not just about creating climate solutions that are just, that address the unequal benefits and burdens that climate change has on certain groups of people, but that the process by which we decide what those policies are is just as important and needs to involve the voices and input and consent of those communities who are most affected. Welcome to Climate Conversations. I'm Rajesh Kusthirangan, your host in the Office of Open Learning with my colleagues, Kurt and Laura. Hi, Rajesh. Hi, hey. Kurt. Hello. We're going to have Lisa Young today. She is the Climate Justice Partnerships Organizer for the Better Future Project, which is also associated with 350 Mass, mm -hmm. uh, climate justice organization yeah, in Massachusetts. Great. Can't wait to hear more about her work. It will be fantastic, I think. Yeah, yeah. This is such an important topic. Lisa works with, you know, what might be considered a fairly mainstream established climate organization here in Massachusetts. You know, I'm a member right out so there not. with it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's predominantly white. It's predominantly middle and upper class people. It's coming out of, no question, that, that kind of frame of the white technocratic privilege perspective. And also the, the topics, the concept of justice and how we deal with it is top of mind for so many people in this movement. So really looking forward to getting into it with Elisa. Great. Let's take a listen. So we are really, really happy to have you here, Lisa. I'm excited to be here. Welcome. Thanks. Okay, Lisa, we're going to start with Climate Justice 101. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what is climate justice? Okay, yeah, no, and even in preparing for this, I'm like, I wrote a whole 70-page you know, <laughs> document all about how do I condense it? Um, but no, that's it's a good exercise to do. Yeah, when I talk about the meaning of climate justice, I do often like start with talking about how it's been defined for actually quite a long time. Frontline community groups, those who are most affected by climate change, and, you know, low-income communities, communities of color, indigenous communities, have been using the phrase and have had principles around climate justice for decades. We actually first saw the phrase climate justice used in a published document in 1999, so almost 20 years ago, you know, a long time ago. What document was that? That was the, the Corp Watch document called Greenhouse Gangsters versus Climate Justice. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> right. Long time ago. This is like, you know, same year as the WTO protests yes. um, in Seattle. That's it's what I of, remember Corp Watch from. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, right. So, you know, kind of anti-globalization, um, anti-kind of multinational corporations, but bringing in this, this climate lens. And um, and then, you know, even the next year in 2000, there was the Climate Justice Summit, the first international climate justice summit at the international climate negotiations. I believe that was COP6. And then, you know, principles were beginning to be formed. And even in the year 2002, we saw a really solid set of climate justice principles eventually being called the Bali principles of climate justice that were in 2002 ratified by environmental justice groups at, that they're at their second national summit. Um, of environmental justice groups. So, you know, 27 principles that really outline what, what we mean by climate justice. So I say all this <laughs> as background to say, you know, this is not my definition. Groups have been using that phrase and have had a very clear meaning for a very long time. Um, but many people maybe don't know about that history, and so that's important to lift that up. So if I were to boil it down, kind of in, in looking at how groups use that phrase over time and how it's been used in those principles, there's kind of like five components that I, that I use to talk about what climate justice means. And the, the first two are familiar to most people. So, you know, it's an acknowledgement that low-income communities, communities of color and indigenous communities in the U.S. and around the world, you know, number one, contribute least to climate change, and number two, suffer the most from climate change. So that's kind of like the bare bones injustice that we're talking about here. And I think many people recognize that and see that very clearly. That's clearly an injustice. The people that did the least are the ones that are hurting the most. And I think people often definitely recognize that on a global level and historically have seen that on a global level. So the global north versus global south kind of divide uh, industrialized countries, you know, white wealthy countries of the, of the north were the ones that did all the pollution and now it's the, you know, poorer, browner countries of the south that are going to suffer the most from the impacts. So that's kind of like the original frame um, that most people are familiar with. But, but anytime you talk with frontline community groups, you are going to hear more than just that of what climate justice really means to them. So, you know, we have those two points. And then a third point is that those same communities 
are left out of conventional climate decision making and organizing processes and spaces. You know, all of those things, you know, are clearly an injustice. And yet, point number four is that these these groups have been resisting fossil fuel, you know, companies and that industry and have been, you know, creating alternative economies and, and ways of living uh, for a really long time. And number five, therefore have a lot of wisdom and resilience and expertise, really, to bear on climate solutions and in being the lead on crafting climate solutions. So kind of th- those are the five, those five points. Uh, you know, they're, they contribute the least, they suffer the most, they're not included in decision-making spaces, and yet they have been doing this for a long time without recognition and actually have a lot of wisdom to bear on, on climate solutions. And so those, I guess, the pieces I really want to lift up, for listeners especially, is that climate justice is not just about creating climate solutions that are just, that address the unequal benefits and burdens that climate change has on certain groups of people, but that the process by which we decide what those policies are is just as important and needs to involve the voices and input and consent of those communities who are most affected. So um, the last point that you mentioned says that there has... I mean, I, I like the word process, but I like the word politics even sure, more. Sure, yeah. Um, and because process has this kind of s- seemingly technocratic feel yeah, to it. Yeah, sure. Right? And so what you're saying is that the politics through which voices that are currently marginalized are brought into the solution space mm-hmm. is as important as the actual outcome. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I would say that those politics exist, those power dynamics exist both kind of in a government sphere of, you know, people's voices, the voices of of the citizenry or of residents in a local area are not being heard in government, but also the politics uh, within organizing spaces as activists, uh, making sure that our organizing spaces and processes for deciding on campaigns and crafting policies that we're going to advocate for, that those are also inclusive spaces. Yeah. Why do you think that right now the places that we do organize and that activism happens aren't as inclusive as they could be? Why is the demographic the way it is right now? Yeah. Short answer is, you know, systemic racism and white supremacy and classism and things that are really, uh, you know, that we find in organizing spaces, we find in all of our spaces, we find in our interpersonal you know, relationships and lives. Um, so acknowledging that those things are present and are difficult to overcome is, I think, really important. But, you know, when you bring those into the light, uh, we can also try to work f- towards creative solutions to to overcome those and address those. And many groups are doing that, right, finding ways to work across class and race, even when historically there's been a really strong divide there. Could we uh, go a little deeper on that? I'd yeah. love to hear maybe a couple of examples of things you've experienced or witnessed, how that difficult dynamic plays out. You know, where are people struggling to take those unassailable five concepts that you've laid out, (laughs) which I think everybody would say, yeah, those are all good, but it's... I'm not so sure, (laughs) Kurt. Okay, everybody. Okay, let's say within the mainstream environmental Mm -hmm. movement, for instance, Mm -hmm. you know, what what does it look like for people to struggle with these things? Mm. Yeah, good question. I mean, yeah, we're at, it's a great question because we are doing this right now in many, many spaces. But, you know, in my in my own personal work within 350 Mass, we're having these conversations. And so it's really actively taking place, yeah, in our community and in movement spaces across the U.S. and, you know, around the world. So, yeah, people really do, you know, struggle. I mean, the environmental justice movement was born in the 80s, like out of a frustration with the environmental movement. I mean, you know, born, you know, for a lot of reasons and from a lot of sources, but with a frustration with the mainstream, you know, majority white, middle class, highly educated environmental movement for not including them, for not considering their community's priorities and interests, their voices, and, and being used and abused in many cases, actually as opportunities for big green environmental groups to get grants to work in those communities or to like use those communities as examples as like poor polluted places that they could, you know, then come and and help and save in some way, but not actually listening to or working with the people in that community. So there's like a really deep history, maybe even just going back to answering more of your question, you know, just like, you know, why do these divides exist? 
there's like a real history there that like and people remember that history and whether or not groups are trying to like do things differently now and you know really work in good faith and with strong principles it's really hard for marginalized communities that have been stabbed in the back in the past to have the trust to work with white uh, mainstream environmental groups again now. So yeah, overcoming that very real history of conflict and of distrust is difficult to do. So we're, we're up against a pretty big battle, but we're having these conversations in our movement spaces. And, you know, really our approach at 350 Mass and Better Future Project has been all right, you know, we, we want to at least get clear on adopting a set of principles, you know, for one, you know, that we all can kind of really feel good about and agree to that really ground us in why this work is important to center the voices of, of those who are most affected by these issues and to partner with those people, you know, why does that matter? And to have those to kind of hold us accountable and to come back to as we continue to do our work um, because it's easy to kind of go astray. So kind of having a set of principles to ground you is really important to educate our base about other movements and their history and their struggles. You know, again, some, sometimes it is as simple as, you know, just raising that awareness. People just don't know about the history of environmental justice or about what people are struggling with in communities of color um, and indigenous communities to this day or what that history is. So yeah. the opposite argument, yeah, sure. something which is often trotted out, is, look, climate change is big enough as it is. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be addressed only by changing policies and practices at a national or you know large scale level, and therefore by bringing in these other issues, you are muddying the waters when what we need is focus, right? So, for example, mm-hmm. and and I have heard this oh, pretty yes, explicitly, me too. right? <laughs> that oh, you know, we need new say alternative energy infrastructure, mm-hmm. and Let's not cross the messages by saying, oh, that alternative energy infrastructure should be created in a manner that blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So what's your response? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's one we hear a lot. And and I get it, right? Like, I want to empathize a little bit. Yes, climate change is an urgent issue. Yes, you know, the impacts of, of this crisis are, are big and lasting, and we don't have much time to try to reverse them and act. Okay, so... Yes, I do acknowledge that, and I um, acknowledge that urgency. So I guess a couple of of responses. One, we as a movement have been, again, there's kind of a whole history here. It's in my thesis. You know, we as a movement have been the the, the mainstream kind of majority white middle class movement since the mid-2000s have been trying that approach, and we haven't gotten too far. Okay, so that's it's one, it's you not know, been all too successful. Yeah, you know, one one you know thing to point out, and you know, and other, we just got to keep trying. I mean, clearly there's a lot of different social movement philosophies and theories of change and ways of going about doing this. So I acknowledge that. But but one perspective is that we've been trying that, you know, we've been we've been trying to create, you know, an urgency around this, create technologies that will solve this problem and make the transition happen from a purely kind of policy and technology level. And, and we're like, we're not we're not there yet. We're not moving fast enough. We're still um, there's still a lot of resistance there's for a lot no of reasons. There's no app for that. <laughs> yeah. No, no, gosh, darn yet. it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that's like one response is like there's an argument for doing things differently. And history does show that when social movements, you know, work across these these historical barriers and divides, that we can become more powerful. And, you know, in our own kind of theory of change in the movement building work that I do, you know, our power comes from people. You know, the fossil fuel companies have their power with their wealth and we've got our people. And the more people we bring in, the more powerful our movement is going to be. And so if we just want to, you know, recruit, you know, scientists and environmentalists and like try to walk up to city council or to Congress and say, save the trees, it's not as powerful as we've got workers, we've got youth, we've got people from marginalized communities with these direct experiences with climate change, hurricanes, with fossil fuel companies in their backyard. You know, we've got these stories. I mean, there's such powerful messengers when you start to bring people who have that lived experience into your movement. And then kind of the other side of the coin, so just kind of in raw people power, you've got more power there. But yeah, it also becomes more powerful kind of in the message 
And, you know, my argument is, too, and again, this might be debated, that there's, there is more wisdom that you're bringing in. And the solutions that you're going to craft are going to be better yeah. if you have those people involved. Well, and especially, I think it's telling that your role is partnerships yeah. organizer. And it's, and it's less about, you know, pulling all of these people and having a, you know, diverse community within, say, mm-hmm. the 350 Mass organization. It's, it's getting behind the the experience and the lived leadership of these other groups and that's a Thanks, yeah, that's kind of a shift that. in in perspective isn't it and and maybe a struggle for some people to to grasp what that really means. Yes, no, thanks for lifting that up. Yeah, that is definitely our approach. And and again, different philosophies, uh, different approaches uh, that maybe different groups or movements might use. But yeah, you know, really honoring the integrity and the, the history and the wisdom and the organizing capacity that existing organizations have in those communities and working with them to lift up their work, to craft solutions together and to like, yeah, build a movement that includes all these different groups and constituencies, yeah. So, I mean, one reason, I think, unstated reason, I think, for the most part, Mm -hmm. why justice organizing is hard is because injustice, by definition, is tied to oppression. Meaning that there's a difference between walking to City Hall and talking to the mayor because you are of the same class and race and and you have access to those things. Mm -hmm. In contrast to other struggles where you can be shot or you can be beaten up or you can be jailed. And so once climate action becomes climate justice, it's inevitable that communities that currently don't face that kind of repression will have to join with others who do and Mm. and maybe face it themselves. Mm. So, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. So privileged people... I mean, even just so I understand what you're saying, like it makes us more vulnerable to yeah. those things. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I can see that. you are you're no longer asking for something that you just think is the right thing. Mm-hmm. You're asking it in the face yeah. of of violence. Yeah, right, right. And with kind of a moral argument versus just yeah, like a technological fix yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a very true. hard uh, burden to bear. I think. Yeah, that's, especially if you don't have to. That's true. Yes. But I still feel like probably, I mean, it's it's the reality that even in the face of increased risk of violence or just of more conflict, white middle class people are still not going to face the same, yeah. the same level of violence and repression and are actually in a position to use their privilege to do direct action, to do civil disobedience, knowing that they're not going to be treated as poorly. I mean, you know, this is, again, these are personal choices people can make as activists, but it's an opportunity for us once we see those injustices and want to work with those communities and lift up their voices to actually use our resources, use our positions, use our access to things to actually, you know, further the cause and and take those risks, knowing that many other people can't take those risks Absolutely. or if they do... So, yeah. I mean, and we have seen that especially, you know, in the last year mm. <laughs> um, when it comes to questions around immigration, uh, around mm. race. Mm-hmm. And and it'll be interesting. I, I feel like those might be some of the tactics that need to be imported into the climate justice movement. Yeah, sure. I mean, I explore this a little bit in my thesis that the 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 mainstream climate movement that began again kind of in the mid 2000s um, was really focused in terms of content and in terms of the actual tactics they used on yeah less risky and more uh, DC beltway kind of tactics of trying to pass a federal climate bill for example I mean that, that was the big that was the big initial push and a big kind of first climate movement on the scene we're trying to get a federal climate bill passed. Um, and the Waxman-Markey bill was the one that was you know, crafted and, and ultimately failed. And it was then that groups, the precursor to 350.org, One Sky, um, was really the leader of that effort. And they, they wrote a public open letter in 2010 that said, all right, we're closing down One Sky. We're going to like really move towards more of a 350.org model, and we're going to do more grassroots organizing. And in response, a month or two later, frontline community groups wrote another open letter in response to them and said, yeah, uh, we've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> uh, we, could, we told you so. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, right, exactly, exactly. But see, that is exactly the thing that even <laughs> in the 
rebranding of the image, mm-hmm. there's still those power relations are built even into that reframing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. One, you know, one thing I've I've heard repeatedly from people who are very experienced in doing this work is, we have to be gentle with ourselves and accepting that we're going to make mistakes. Yes. We're going to make some messes, but not let the fear of that hold us back from stepping in to, yeah. uh, to building relationships in a different yes. way. And, yeah, no, yeah. I appreciate you saying that. Knowing that we've got these barriers we face, like what do we do? Yeah, acknowledging that those exist, that there are things that are going to make collaboration difficult and messy, but yeah, not letting that stop us from doing that work and you know, finding those creative solutions and learning from our mistakes and you know, knowing that it might be a little painful along the way, but it's worth it. So let me ask you a question about, I mean, it's one thing to sort of open up your space for more diverse voices, Mm -hmm. but ultimately it's also going to be whose leadership do you accept, right? Because, I mean, if you're saying that, oh, yes, we are now expanding the tent, it's bigger, blah, 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 Mm -hmm. but who is at the center of the tent and who is at the periphery is always going to be one of the questions. Yeah, yeah. And, And you mentioned that there are communities who have already understood ways of living that mm-hmm. are fundamentally, I think, better. Mm-hmm. And so how do we get their voices not just into the tent, but to be the mm-hmm. frame around which the tent is made? At the forefront. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. That's the big question. And again, there's like a big culture shift that needs to happen. It's not even like, how do we physically bring them in and have them at the table? But, you know, for others to listen and really, you know, learn and accept and lift up and understand the importance of that perspective in in crafting our solutions. So so yeah, it's just as much a challenge of of building the relationships with those communities, building the trust that they're so, you know for them to even want to be a part, right? Again, to overcome these historical conflicts between our groups and and between our constituencies. So, you know, to 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 create that trust to even have them at the table and then to have the other groups who are supposedly inviting them in to actually be willing to listen. I mean, you know, I suppose, again, I don't mean to keep referencing my thesis, but there were, you know, I, I, I list a few barriers to collaboration in my thesis and then how those were overcome by the planning committee that planned the People's Climate March in 2014 in New York City. Because they were, you know, this was a lot of the big green environmental groups partnering with, you know, kind of small community-based environmental justice groups rooted in communities of color in New York and other places, um, and also labor unions. So kind of three different, you know, constituencies, cultures, ways of seeing things, all sitting around a table trying to plan a march. Um, (laughs) You can expect that that was a struggle. And, you know, in talking with the organizers through my research, it was. But through that struggle and working through that, they, they really came together and pulled something amazing off and had some lasting impacts and relationships. But some of the ways, you know, that they did that, having shared principles was really, really, really key. That everyone was on the same page that, you know, and that, that you could, you know, call folks out, wait a second, we agreed to this set of, of principles where we said, you know, we were going to center these voices or we were going to, you know, make sure that this was a bottom-up exercise and not a top-down one or that, you know, we were going to commit to, to self-transformation through this process. You know, just these are part of the Hamez principles for democratic organizing that PCM planners used. So committing to a set of principles and agreeing to those and, and holding yourself accountable to those that, that everyone in the room can use to be accountable to those. Shared funding is a really big one that just kept coming up in my research of people being like, that's the problem, you know, um, which makes sense. A lot of bigger organizations, more mainstream environmental organizations, have access to funding and foundations and grants that many of these environmental justice groups just don't have. The foundations just aren't interested in funding that work, or those organizations don't have the resources to seek out those grants. I mean, there's just a whole lot of inequities in the funding world. And so when you're engaging in a collaboration with these other groups across these race and class divides, really you know, looking for ways to share funding and make the, the funding more equitable for the project that you're working on together. And that's got to be, yeah. I mean, knowing how yeah. the world of money works, nobody wants to share funding, Yeah, right? oh yeah, right, <laughs> right. And you want like, you want the money and you want the credit for it. I mean, yeah. Because, yeah. because the credit is tied to you getting more funding from the same yeah. foundation. And so, yeah, it's, it's hard. But, you know, environmental groups or, or others, you know, that have more privilege, 
really taking a deep breath and saying, all right, you know, we'll give a chunk of this to you. Or, you know, when we're going to hire new organizers, you can be a part of that process and we can hire folks from your community, not just, you know, our own organizers. You've talked a lot about the best practices that organizations should follow Mm -hmm. when they're trying to create climate activism and listen to marginalized groups. Have you got examples of organizations that you've that you look up to that have Mm. done a really good job of bringing in marginalized groups and getting them involved? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'll name the the big ones, which I know that organizations of different scale working in different geographies and, you know, it's all different. It's all hard and, you know, unique in the different circumstances you're in. But I want to like openly give credit to 350.org and to Sierra Club as like two big organizations that I I look up to and, you know, as a a local 350, you know, Massachusetts chapter, 350.org and and, and others serve as like a model for what we should be doing. So, you know, again, in in my thesis, I kind of show the evolution of that organization over time. And there, there, there was, you know, quite a quite a shift over time and a lot of reflection within that organization. But like where they've landed today, I think, is a really impressive place of, you know, not only being very public and open about their commitment to climate justice in principle, about their commitment to working with frontline communities, you know, and in all their messaging, while well, they're clear in their core mission of reducing emissions, you know, to 350 parts per million, you know, that's in their name, that's still their, their core mission. But in the stories that they lift up from around the world about climate change in the groups that they work with, that they try to support, and in their actual campaigns that they do and the groups that they partner with to build those and execute those campaigns, it's always about centering frontline communities. Maybe I shouldn't say always, but really, you know, they, they do, I think, a really wonderful job. Um, and it seems very genuine. And that's both both global and local level. So I'll lift it up as an example, the Dakota Access Pipeline fight um, that I think probably most listeners are familiar with that really uh, reached its peak, you know, last fall. Um, but is ongoing against the pipeline in the Dakotas. We know that the success of that <laughs> campaign was really the the voices of the indigenous people on the ground who were fighting for their sacred land and water. And, you know, against this pipeline, and, and some groups did try to take advantage of that pipeline fight to push their own agenda, to really talk about climate change or about the fossil fuel industry from that perspective. But many groups really allowed the center of the campaign messaging and everything to be about the Native people's struggles and what their interests were and what they wanted the message to be for this campaign and what solutions they wanted to put forth for addressing this and not trying to brand it as as a, as a climate issue and, and take over. Because they easily could have, groups like 350 and others, could have and nothing was perfect oh my gosh there was still a lot of a lot of things that could have been done better by climate groups and climate activists and others in that but I think all of us saw you know when we think about that fight we don't think of it as a you know as the number one thing being a climate fight we think of it as being an indigenous sovereignty fight and that's that's really core and that's because climate groups like 350 and others did take a step back and did allow for that going from no DPL to Mm -hmm. 350 mass yeah what challenges have you faced in expanding to be yeah. to holding those principles, bringing sort of true partnership? What's hard? Yeah, so much, so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, there's um, this is really hard work. It's very emotionally demanding. It's a lot easier when you're just trying to fight for a policy fix or a technology fix or something. I don't know. It's just hard when you're trying to like actually shift a whole culture of an organization or like build partnerships across these like really deep chasms of race and class divides. So anyway, it's hard. The organization, even before I was there, I've been there for about a year, has been working to build partnerships with with other groups, you know, for a while, seeing that there is power in us, you know, working as a, a broader progressive movement on these issues and not just as a siloed, you know, environmental climate movement on these issues. So some of the the partnerships that we've been trying to build um, even prior to my arrival are really within like the labor movement, for example. And that, I mean, there's a there's a whole nother history there. It's funny, in my thesis, I don't even really talk about the labor environment divide that has a long, ugly history in the United States and around the world. So creating those partnerships is huge and historic and and difficult, but we've made some strides and so that's been really exciting. But in doing so, we've got to make those relationships, 
right? Like build that trust, find that those those connections between our issues um, and kind of a, a sense of common goals that we can we can go for together. And then kind of more recently, I would say, I guess what I should highlight and the challenges I've been facing is I've been trying to help us maintain those those labor relationships, but also build relationships with environmental justice groups, racial justice groups. And yeah, the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Like this is really, um, you know, a major issue of our time. Of course, it's been an issue of our time for a long time, but working across those those race lines. And I think, that, again, there's just a lot of mistrust. Communities, uh, organizations from those communities working with majority white environmental organizations. I mean, we've we've even heard from some like, we just don't want to work with you. Like, we don't trust you. We don't want to work with We don't have an interest in working with you, period, right? And I, like, respect that. Like, I understand, like, where they're coming from. And there are others that are like, yeah, let's do this. This is going to be hard. We see things in a very different way. But let's, like, let's start to build together. Let's start to see where this goes. And we can see a benefit of, you know, working with you and, you, you know, leveraging your resources and that, that you will benefit from working with us and that we could really team up together. And one project actually that I could go into kind of a, a project I did early this year, convening a, a local coalition to plan the People's Climate March for 2017 earlier this year that involved environmental justice groups from communities of color in the Boston area, um, labor organizations, faith and youth groups, and traditional climate groups. And, you know, we, we planned that march, and there's more I could say about that, but the group is continuing to meet, and the intention of that group, actually, um, and continuing to meet isn't to try to devise joint campaigns or, you know, policy advocacy work, but is to like just build relationships with each other, which is like what we know is like really what is needed, like at the foundation of if we if we want to do joint campaigns in the future and advocate for policies that are really intersectional, that not only reduce emissions, but also create jobs and also, you know, address inequities in in local communities and kind of build this visionary future together. If we want to do that, like we're first just going to need to get to know each other and trust each other. It's kind of a long road process. Yeah. Like, you know, commitment. It's not an overnight thing, which I think, especially for a lot of climate activists and a lot of, um, I think, maybe even white people, we want to see results quick and we want to do what is fastest and most efficient in the world we live in. So, you know, folks really got to be patient. And it is that's, that's a challenge. That's hard for me. That's hard for everyone in our network to know that this is going to be an incremental process that will lead us toward the change that we need and have to, you know, the power that we need to have to accomplish our goals. But we're going to have to be patient and make sure that the process is done in the right way so that we can get there. Um, And if we try to rush it, we're going to be cut short with not the power that we need and not the solutions that we need. And make more of those mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for naming that. Because you've just described me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We're going to take action. We're going to get this thing done. And uh, I might I might want my answer to win, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's it's a real powerful unlearning process in a mm-hmm. sense to step back from that. Yeah. And uh, it is. I feel myself stretching all the time and hopefully my my colleagues around me going through the same process. So mm-hmm. thank you for for naming that and doing mm-hmm. what you're doing here. Yeah, yeah. So as we draw this conversation to a, a bit of a close, what would your message be to people from marginalized communities who are interested in getting involved in environmental action? How do they become part of this conversation? Hmm. So I guess my message would be almost in every area. I think a lot of people are like, you know, a lot of those communities aren't organized or like, you know, there's refugees in my community, but I don't know if they have. They are more often than not organized, you know, whether in informal ways as a community or in formal organizations and nonprofits. And so I'm encouraging them to find to find a space that feels welcoming and comfortable for them and that speaks to their passion on these issues. And that space could be 350 Mass. We have chapters all over the state. Um, or that space could be a local organization, you know, with folks that maybe identify more closely with their own situation. And I'm just a believer in, like, collective action and social movements and, and getting together with other people and collaborating. And so it can be so empowering. I've spent a lot of my life as an activist and just, like, there's so much power in that. Um, so for those who are, like, 
never done activism and like but really care about these issues and want to get involved find an organization organizing that's that's how we do this work and they do exist and they will likely be one in your neighborhood or in your community um, maybe in your church community and um, there's often you know the church itself or there's committees within the church or you know whatever it is um, where you can be with other people who are passionate about that same issue that can identify with where you're coming from and that want to work together to take action to make a change you can find groups that are doing this all over. Maybe there's instances where there's not one in your in your area, but I there's online communities that you can join. Like there are ways to get involved, and like and you, you are not alone. <laughs> that's right. Yes, become a member of Climate X. You you are not alone. And I think that's like step number one. Maybe is what I'm coming to is make sure you're not just doing this on your own or banging your head against the wall at home or listening to the news and feeling hopeless. Like you got to get together with other people, build community, and then work together with that group and others to try to to try to make change happen. And again, 350 Mass is a place where, where you can do that and, and where we welcome people, but many other organizations too. And that's, you know, my role is to try to help us connect with those other organizations and build this broader based progressive network of groups that are pushing for a better future. You know, one that, again, has less emissions and is, is working against climate change, but is, is trying to address so many other of the ills in our society and um, building the world that we know that we need. Well, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us um, and being part of this climate conversation. And it's been great hearing about the work you've been doing at 350. Thanks for having me. This is really fun. Boy, that was a lot of <laughs> interesting material. Yeah. It's so good to hear about the recognition that it hasn't been right in the past and that there's so much more they can do and actually getting those principles together to help them work out, okay, over at 350, what are we doing? What have we done wrong in the past? And what can we do more to bring marginalized communities into the conversation? Yeah, I mean, as for me personally, I feel like I'm the epitome of the mindset that needs to shift through hearing this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing to, you know, read through the principles and, and kind of take them in and say, yeah, that, that makes sense. But then trying to put them in practice and to live it out uh, is, is a, is a different beast and one that I think we're all trying to grapple with. And I'm hopeful that our Climate X uh, members and our listeners can join us in that journey. And let's, uh, let's talk about what we're experiencing and what we're seeing. Definitely. We'd love to hear from you. If you have an experience of an organization, uh, an environmental action organization who are doing a fantastic job of listening to their local communities and listening to marginalized populations, let us know. We want to hear those stories. As usual. You can reach us on Facebook, on Twitter, and of course, our own email address, which is climatex at mit.edu. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>